chapter fourteen of dr quintard chaplain c s a and second bishop of tennessee by charles todd quintard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen personal narrative the close of the war from columbus i made my way as best i could with my family to atlanta where i was the guest of my friend mr richard peters the affairs of the confederacy its armies its political organization had all come to naught general thomas and his army had effected a junction with general grant cavalry infantry and artillery completely surrounded the confederate forces whose supply of ammunition was nearly exhausted overwhelming circumstances compelled the capitulation of general lee at appomattox court house on sunday april ninth eighteen sixty five a few days later occurred the assassination of president lincoln and that event was followed by the proclamation offering a reward for the apprehension of jefferson davis and certain other persons not as the chief actors in the recent war but as particeps criminis in that atrocious crime in my stay at atlanta i was brought somewhat in touch with the march of events on the twentieth of may the hon ben hill was brought to atlanta he had been an intimate friend of president davis and was a man of fine intellect he bore himself nobly in the then depressing state of affairs i had a long and most interesting conversation with him mr mallory who had been secretary of the confederate navy seemed to take a pessimistic view of the situation and told me that his greatest regret was that he had spent four years of his life in working for a people unfit for independence major-general howell cobb although a paroled prisoner of war was brought into atlanta under guard probably to accompany mr hill and mr mallory to washington i had half an hour's conversation with him he told me that he had no regrets for the past so far as his own conduct was concerned for he was willing to let his record stand without the dotting of an i or the crossing of a t that he felt that the future had nothing in store for him that he was willing to submit to the united states laws and that he had no desire to escape from the united states officers indeed said he were there now two paths before me one leading to the woods and the other to the gallows i would rather take the latter than compromise my self-respect by attempting to escape on sunday the twenty first of may i officiated in the central presbyterian church atlanta there was an immense congregation present it was made up of about an equal number of federals and confederates before beginning the service i made a brief address in which i expressed my view as to the duties of all true men in the then present condition of the country i said that every man should do his utmost to heal the wounds and to hide the seams and scars of the fratricidal war that had just closed i told the congregation that i would not use the prayer for the president of the united states at that service simply because it had not yet been authorized by the bishop of the diocese whose ecclesiastical jurisdiction in the matter i recognized i then proceeded with the service a few evenings later major e b beaumont adjutant-general on major-general wilson's staff took tea with us he was from wilkes bar pennsylvania and an intimate friend of mr peters relatives in that state as soon as he reached macon he wrote to mr peters requesting him to call on him for any assistance he might be able to render he was then on his way home on thirty days leave he was a graduate of west point and like all from that institution with whom i was ever brought in contact a gentleman from him i heard the federal side of the story of the columbus fight i appreciated more than ever how utterly absurd was the attempt on the part of the confederates to defend the place we had but a handful of untrained militia and a squad of veterans from the hospitals against thirteen thousand of the best disciplined and best equipped troops of the federal army from atlanta i started for nashville accompanied by my family and my friend mr peters who was most anxious to get to philadelphia the railroad between atlanta and chattanooga had been destroyed but had been rebuilt as far south as kingston georgia i found an old friend the engineer in charge of the work of construction who gladly received us into his coach and provided us with abounding hospitality 
as there was considerable difficulty in getting through chattanooga i called upon the federal commander at kingston and asked him if he would kindly facilitate my movements i handed him my passport upon which he endorsed his name and asked me to hand it to an officer in an adjoining room the latter to my surprise provided me with free passes to nashville arrived at nashville i was very cordially received at the residence of my friend colonel harry yateman this was on a friday the next day the rev w d harlow then in charge of christ church called upon me i said to him in the course of our conversation i shall be glad to take part with you in the services to-morrow for the hall used by my congregation previous to the war had been taken by the military in eighteen sixty two and converted into barracks and my congregation was scattered perhaps you had better not he said and pray why not i asked the authorities might not like it he replied very well i rejoined if they do not like it let them come and arrest me i shall not object in the least i learned subsequently that he had called upon general parkhurst of michigan then provost marshal of nashville informed him of my arrival and asked him if i would be permitted to officiate ah replied the general has the doctor returned where does he officiate i shall be glad to attend his services later i was called upon to visit the general's wife in sickness and i found myself very busily engaged in visiting the sick and wounded of the federal forces at nashville and in burying their dead for weeks i was in constant attendance in the hospitals and in camp gradually i began to realize that i had been unconsciously converted from a confederate to a federal chaplain when i decided to take my family to new york i was waited upon by a committee of federal officers the chairman of which made a touching address and asked me to accept a purse of gold in token of the high appreciation in which my services had been held by the federal officers in nashville i need hardly say that i was both surprised and gratified in those days the railways were in charge of military conductors the coaches were greatly crowded and it was difficult to obtain seats but general parkhurst came to my assistance sent his adjutant to the railway station to secure seats for me and my family and placed a guard over them thus my family made a very comfortable journey on reaching new york i was most cordially received by my friend the rev dr morgan rector of st thomas church and was invited to preach for him the following sunday his was therefore the first church in the north in which i preached or held service of any kind after the war i returned to tennessee on the first of september eighteen sixty five and on the sixth of that month a special convention of the diocese met in pursuance of the call of the standing committee to elect a bishop to succeed bishop Oti, who had died in april eighteen sixty three the convention met in christchurch nashville on the second day the convention proceeded to the election and in the afternoon of that day the president of the convention the rev dr pease announced that the clergy by an almost unanimous vote had nominated me for that high office the laity retired to consider the nomination and soon returned and reported that they had ratified the same the president thereupon announced that i had been duly elected bishop of the diocese of tennessee with my consecration in st luke's church philadelphia in the presence of the general convention of the protestant episcopal church in the united states of america on wednesday the eleventh of october eighteen sixty five i felt that the war between the states was indeed over End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of dr quintard chaplain c s a and second bishop of tennessee by charles todd quintard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen a long episcopate the consecration of dr quintard to the episcopate of tennessee was of peculiar significance in the history of the church in the united states the consecration took place at the first meeting of the general convention after the close of the war at that convention all doubts as to the mutual relations of the northern and southern dioceses were dispelled 
the latter had never been dropped from the roll of the general convention notwithstanding the fact that pending the war they had been forced by the exigencies of the case to withdraw from the northern diocese and organize the protestant episcopal church in the confederate states of america they were still regarded as constituent members of the american national church each day of the convention meeting in eighteen sixty two the southern dioceses had been called in their proper turn beginning with alabama and though absent their right to be present was never questioned still the question must have arisen in the minds of many of the southern churchmen as to how far this feeling might extend among the church people of the north with the general convention meeting in philadelphia in october came the opportunity for the church and the church people of the north to express clearly their feelings towards their southern brethren and this they did first by the cordial welcome extended to the two southern bishops present and to the clerical and lay deputies in attendance from three southern dioceses secondly by the ratification of the consecration of the right rev dr wilmer to the episcopate of alabama which had taken place in eighteen sixty two at the hands of southern bishops acting wholly independently of the church in the north and thirdly by the almost unanimous vote upon the report made to the house of deputies on the consecration of the bishop-elect of tennessee wholly ignoring the especially conspicuous official position he had held in the confederate army and the prominent part he had taken in the affairs of the church in the confederate states his consecration therefore furnished a very significant act by which to crown the work of reunion of the northern and southern dioceses the service of consecration was in dignity of ritual quite in advance of the times dr quintard prepared himself therefore by a vigil held in the church of st james the less the consecrator was the right rev dr hopkins bishop of vermont and presiding bishop of the church in the united states five other bishops of northern dioceses united in the act of consecration as did also the right rev francis fulford d d bishop of montreal and metropolitan of canada whose presence contributed to a growing sense of the unity of the church throughout the whole american continent in the history of the diocese of tennessee the consecration of a second bishop marked of course a distinct and important epoch that diocese had met with other losses than that of her antebellum bishop the war had swept away to a large extent the results of his work and that of his clergy all the horrors of war had been visited upon the state and diocese churches had been mutilated and destroyed and congregations had been scattered the effects of the war were very deeply impressed upon the mind of the new and young bishop in the first series of visitations made by him in his diocese a sad and laborious journey beginning in november eighteen sixty five the evidences of devastation were fresh and visible on every side in some places where before there were promising parishes and missions there was no fit building left standing in which services could be held only three churches in the whole diocese were uninjured and very few were fit for occupation many were in ruins the returns from two of the parishes showed similarly severe inroads upon congregations in one of these there remained sixty-five out of a hundred and forty-seven communicants reported before the war in the other ten only remained out of sixty-five previously reported the bishop never faltered as he confronted conditions which foretold the anxious care the exhausting labors the weary journeys the disappointments the fears and the griefs the coming years were to bring it was with the utmost cheerfulness that he took up the burden of the episcopate and in gathering up the disjecta membra of the church in tennessee and in strengthening the things that remained bishop quintard was a marvel in labors in journeyings and in the care of all the churches he was truly an apostle not a step behind any of the heroes of the american missionary episcopate his jurisdiction though nominally a diocese was virtually a missionary district in all respect save that it never received its due proportion of the church's funds devoted to missionary enterprises 
with far-sighted statesmanship dr quintard perceived in eighteen sixty five that the church's effectiveness could be enhanced by the division of the diocese of tennessee and the establishment of the see episcopate in the three chief cities memphis nashville and knoxville and from that time on a division of the diocese that would increase the efficiency of the work of the church therein was kept constantly before the minds of the people but strange to say the very arguments used in support of the plea for the relief needed were made the excuse for not granting it it is impossible for the church to grow in such a large territory under the supervision of a single bishop let him work never so hard nor so wisely constantly pleaded the diocese of tennessee the church is not growing fast enough in the diocese of tennessee to warrant a division of that diocese and an increase of episcopal supervision therein was the invariable reply and so it was not until five years before the bishop's death not until after he had worn himself out by his efforts to perform single-handed the work of three bishops in his diocese not until after repeated illness had warned him that he must have relief that a coadjutor was elected and consecrated for him the widespread popularity of dr quintard his personal magnetism and the large-hearted charity he had manifested in time of war were not without their effect for a time upon the work he had undertaken wherever he appeared there flocked to meet him his old friends of the camp and battlefield they felt that the religion he preached having stood the test of adversity in war time was a good religion for times of peace a good religion to rule the everyday business of life they readily yielded in large numbers to his persistent appeals to them to confess christ before men in his record of official acts published in the diocesan journal from year to year he noted such gratifying incidents as the baptism and confirmation at his hands of some of the officers and men with whom his acquaintance had begun on the battlefield or in camp in the few months that elapsed between his consecration and the meeting of his first diocesan convention three hundred and fourteen persons were confirmed by him in tennessee and that number was a good yearly average of his confirmations for nearly thirty-three years and his four hundred and seventy confirmations a hundred and fifty-two sermons and a hundred and twelve addresses reported to the convention in eighteen sixty seven for the first full year of his episcopate were a sample of the pace he set for himself at the beginning of his episcopate but as before the war bishop oti in an episcopate of little less than twenty-nine years discovered that there was a remarkable tendency among churchmen to move away from tennessee so it was after the war as bishop quintard was to find bishop oti confirmed more than six thousand persons in tennessee yet the diocese never numbered more than three thousand five hundred communicants before the war arrested its development many of those whom the antebellum bishop confirmed took their way like the star of empire westward and began to colonize the dioceses of missouri texas and california bishop quintard by actual count confirmed more than twelve thousand persons and yet his diocese was never to the day of his death able to count six thousand communicants despite the difficulties of the field in which it was given him to labor for the upbuilding of the church the bishop was in the forefront of every movement which went on in the church in the latter part of the nineteenth century he was a pioneer in the adoption of the cathedral system in the american church he was among the first to utilize the work of the sisterhoods in the administration of diocesan charitable institutions with his refined and cultivated tastes it was natural that he should give attention to the improvement of ecclesiastical architecture in his diocese and he was a leader in the work of the church for the negro in eighteen eighty three a conference of bishops presbyters and laymen was held in sewanee to consider the relations of the church to the colored people of the south a canon was proposed for the organization of work among colored people which when it came before the general convention was known as the sewanee canon it was never adopted by the general convention but the work among the negroes in tennessee was organized in accordance with its suggestions in the list of the american episcopate bishop quintard's name is the seventy-fifth 
it is an unusual name especially conspicuous by beginning with an unusual letter these may seem trivial circumstances to receive mention here but the fact is that they seem significant of the striking position which the bishop held among his brethren of the peculiarities of his personality and of the attention he attracted to himself throughout the country he was as has been seen a link between the antebellum and the postbellum bishop he was likewise a link between the clergymen of the old school and those of the new it is curious to those who knew him later than eighteen seventy to see him represented in the portraits taken soon after his elevation to the episcopate wearing the bands the surviving fragment of the broad collars worn in milton's time he probably gave them up about the time of his first visit to england in eighteen sixty seven he must have been among the first in america to wear his college hood when officiating for it is related that after he had officiated on one occasion in a church in connecticut a lady was heard to exclaim in great indignation the idea of that southern bishop coming to this church and wearing a rebel flag on his back in sympathy with the oxford movement in the church of england he was a leader in that movement as it affected the church in america and so was called a high churchman at a time when that term was of somewhat different application from what it is now and he was then called a ritualist and was regarded as an extremist though at the present day he would be considered a very moderate ritualist he was always a welcome visitor in all parts of the country and people not only delighted to hear him preach but especially enjoyed social intercourse with him his conversation was extremely entertaining partly because of the breadth of his experiences in times of war and in times of peace as a traveller in england and as the hard-working bishop of a southern diocese but also because his talk scintillated with wit and quick repartee when some one in new york asked him why he had named a church in sewanee st paul's on the mountain he answered sewanee is cherokee indian for mother mountain and you know st paul preached on mars hill on another occasion a man was attempting to argue with him in regard to what he chose to call the use of forms in the church well said the bishop you know that when the earth was without form it was void and that is the way with many christians the bishop enjoyed a reputation as a pulpit orator that became wider than national his voice was as musical as the lute and resonant as a bugle the southern newspapers between eighteen sixty eight and eighteen seventy five praised his eloquence and noted the fact that in spite of his belonging to a school of thought not altogether popular in the south at that time people of all shades of opinion thronged the churches to hear him preach he was a ready extemporaneous speaker yet his sermons were for the most part carefully prepared and written out and delivered from the manuscript some of them became widely known through many repetitions and not a few became famous one of these had a history the bishop was as fond of telling as he was of repeating the sermon it was known as the bishop's samson sermon and was from the text i will go out as at other times and shake myself judges sixteen twenty when first delivered in one of the parishes of tennessee the bishop was informed by a disgusted hearer that it was positively indecent and not fit to be preached before any congregation consequently the sermon was retired until it was almost forgotten some time afterward however it was by accident included among sermons provided for use on one of the bishop's series of visitations and when discovered with his homiletic ammunition the bishop read it over carefully but without finding anything in it that could be characterized as indecent so he determined to try it again it made a deep and wholesome impression upon the minds of those who then heard it he preached it one sunday night in christchurch st louis and after the service a gentleman said to him bishop if you will preach that sermon here to-morrow night i will have this church full of men to hear you the sermon was accordingly preached the following night and the gentleman kept his promise the sermon was preached at trinity college port hope canada at west point before a congregation of cadets at sewanee tennessee before successive classes of students of the university of the south it was preached everywhere the bishop went 
usually at some one's request who had heard it before and who wanted the impression made on his mind at the first hearing renewed numberless were the letters received by the bishop telling him of hearing that sermon and of good resulting from it in his repeated visits to england bishop quintard enjoyed a distinction never before and rarely since accorded to any member of the american episcopate the first of these visits was made in eighteen sixty seven in order that he might be present at and participate in the meeting of the first pan-anglican or lambeth conference he attended subsequent conferences up to eighteen ninety seven a few months before his death at each of these visits he was the recipient of an unusual amount of attention from english bishops and from the english people of every rank and he revolutionized the opinions of the englishmen of that day as to america and americans the english newspapers were captivated by his powers in the pulpit one of the liverpool daily papers said that the bishop of tennessee speaks english better than an englishman and preaches with the fire and clearness of lacadere one of the leading london papers devoted two editorial columns to a description of him and said the bishop of tennessee is the first american we ever heard whose speech did not bewray him his exterior is impressive his voice strong and searching and his enunciation deliberate his well-turned sentences are like solid carved mahogany he is a type of the highest average of the american public man his sermon was in every sense sufficient strong well knit and balanced and adequately emotional while never falling short of the full dignity of the preacher's office and evident character if the church in america has many such bishops it is indeed a living efflorescent healing branch of the great tree which according to dr quintard has never withered a day in england since the epoch of the apostles he was a guest of the bishop of london at fulham palace was present at his ordination examinations and took part with him in the ordination of twenty-five priests and nineteen deacons in the famous chapel royal whitehall at the invitation of the bishop of london he preached the first sermon at the special evening services in st paul's cathedral he officiated at the service at the laying of the cornerstone of the church of st paul old brentford the stone being laid by her royal highness mary adelaide princess of tech he laid the foundation stone of st chad's church haggiston london he was present with bishops from the far-away south sea islands from canada and elsewhere at the laying of the foundation stone of keble memorial college oxford he reopened the restored parish church of garstag he assisted the archbishop of york and preached the sermon at the consecration of the church of st michael sheffield he assisted the archbishop of york at the parish church sheffield where a class numbering six hundred was confirmed he administered the apostolic rite for the bishops of london and winchester and on the invitation of the bishops of oxford and ely took part in their lenten missions in eighteen sixty eight a second visit was made in eighteen seventy five seventy six his reception by the most reverend the archbishops the right reverend the bishops the clergy and the laity of the english church was all that could be asked on two occasions he administered the apostolic rite of confirmation for the lord bishop of london and on two occasions held confirmations at the request of the archbishop of canterbury he assisted the archbishop of york also at the confirmation of more than five hundred candidates presented in one class by the invitation of the archbishop of canterbury he participated in the opening services of the convocation of canterbury and was the first bishop of the church not a member of the convocation to be admitted to that service the service was held in the chapel of henry the seventh in westminster abbey he assisted at the opening service of keble college oxford the laying of the foundation stone of which he had witnessed eight years before he united with bishops of the anglican communion from england and africa in the consecration in st paul's cathedral of a bishop for asia the right rev dr milne bishop of bombay he visited the continent also and scotland 
attended the church congress at stoke upon trent and assisted at the consecration of the cathedral of cumbrae in the diocese of argyle and the isles returning to england he was again present at the opening of the convocation of canterbury the degree of doctor of laws was conferred upon him by the university of cambridge on the occasion of this visit he was again in england in eighteen eighty one and attended by invitation the funeral of dean stanley july twenty fifth on the invitation of the queen's domestic chaplain the hon and rev dr wellesley he preached in the chapel royal windsor on sunday august fourteenth no american had ever previously been invited to preach in this chapel he took for his text on that occasion if thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee then how canst thou contend with horses and if in the land of peace wherein thou treadest they wearied thee then how wilt thou do in the swelling of jordan jeremiah twelve five in these three visits therefore the bishop performed every service appertaining to the episcopal office such experiences were absolutely unique for an american bishop at that time it had often been asserted that the bishop and clergy of the church in america were not permitted to officiate in the church of england these visits of the bishop not only gave him an extended acquaintance among the bishops and clergy and prominent laity of the english church but changed the relations between them and the american church so that the latter has since been held in higher regard by the church of england how much this was influential in leading up to the present amicable relations existing between england and america it is not necessary for us to inquire though doubtless such an influence might be taken into account in tracing up the history of the present anglo-american alliance in eighteen eighty seven the bishop was in england and was present by invitation of the dean of westminster in the abbey at the queen's jubilee he assisted at an anniversary service of the order of st john of jerusalem in the chapel royal savoy as a chaplain of the order he attended a meeting in the chapter house clerkenwell gate the following year as chaplain of the order he assisted at the installation of his royal highness the prince of wales now edward the seventh as grand prior of the order of st john in succession to the duke of manchester who for twenty-five years had held the office he was also in attendance in eighteen eighty eight at the lambeth conference was the guest of the archbishop at lambeth palace and assisted at the consecration of two bishops with the lord bishop of peterborough he was a presenter of one of them the rev dr thickness consecrated bishop suffragan of leicester in the diocese of peterborough End of chapter fifteen Chapter 16 of Dr. Quintard, Chaplain C.S.A., and Second Bishop of Tennessee by Charles Todd Quintard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Bishop Quintard and Sewanee the enthusiasm with which bishop quintard immediately after his consecration took up and pushed forward whatever promised to be of spiritual benefit to the people of the south was characteristic of the man especially attractive to him was the scheme set forth in the address by bishop polk to the bishops of the southern diocese published in eighteen fifty six emphasizing the importance of building up an educational institution upon broad foundations for the promotion of social order civil justice and christian truth to be centrally located within the southern states the scheme had been formulated and developed by its projector and originator bishop polk and the university of the south was duly organized in eighteen fifty seven a liberal charter was secured from the state of tennessee title was acquired to a domain of nearly ten thousand acres of land upon the top of sewanee mountain the cornerstone of a main college building was laid and pledges of an endowment amounting to half a million of dollars were obtained before the war broke out in the fall of eighteen sixty five before his election to the episcopate dr quintard met upon a train between nashville and columbia the rev david pease a prominent presbyter of the diocese of tennessee and secretary of the board of trustees of the university of the south as it was organized before the war 
on the same train was major george r fairbanks of florida a lay trustee on said board the conversation of these three gentlemen was upon the proposed university the magnificent domain secured for that institution it was asserted would revert to its donors unless the proposed university were in operation within ten years of the date of the donation that is in eighteen sixty eight dr quintard pledged himself not only to save the domain but to revive the scheme for the university and to establish such an institution of learning as bishop polk bishop o t and others had in view when the university of the south was organized in eighteen fifty seven the day that he took his seat for the first time in the house of bishops dr quintard entered into correspondence with the rev john austin merrick d d a man of godly and sound learning and offered to meet him in winchester tennessee on a specified day to go with him to sewanee and see what might be done toward carrying out the educational enterprise which was intended to mean so much to the southern people and which meant all the more to them in the condition in which the war had left them the way for such a movement had been prepared at the special convention of the diocese of tennessee at which dr quintard had been elected bishop reviving a measure that had evidently been adopted in eighteen sixty one at the last convention over which bishop oti had presided the journal of this convention was lost in the printing office to which it was committed for publication the special convention of eighteen sixty five appointed a committee to take measures for establishing with the concurrence of the executive committee of the board of trustees of the university a diocesan training and theological school upon the university domain dr quintard as bishop-elect had made sure that the war had not impaired the charter nor up to that time the title to the domain even though it had swept away the endowment and though soldiers of both armies marching over the mountain and encamping about the spot had amused themselves by blowing up the cornerstone laid in eighteen sixty and making out of the fragments trinkets for their sweethearts in the course of his first series of visitations throughout his immense diocese in march eighteen sixty six bishop quintard arrived in winchester and there met the rev dr merrick the rev thomas a morris rector of the church in winchester and major george r fairbanks accompanied by these gentlemen he ascended the mountain visited university place sewanee and found shelter and a most cordial hospitality in a log cabin occupied by mr william tomlinson he selected locations for buildings for the diocesan training school and a site for a chapel in the evening he erected a rustic cross about twelve feet in height upon the latter site which is the exact spot whereon now stands the oratory of st luke's hall gathered around the cross with the bishop and his companions were members of mr tomlinson's household a few mountaineers and some negro workmen the nicene creed was recited and the bishop knelt down and prayed god to give to those who were then engaging in a great enterprise grace both to perceive and know what things they ought to do and strength faithfully to fulfil the same the woods rang with the strains of a gloria in excelsis it was a scene worthy of association with those of the sixteenth century where discoverers and conquistadores preempted new lands by planting a cross and claiming the territory for their king and for the church thus was the domain at sewanee reclaimed for the king of kings and for the cause of christian education the site selected for the university in antebellum times was ideal for the purpose to which it was consecrated sewanee was on a spur of the cumberland mountains a plateau some two thousand feet above the level of the sea and about one thousand feet above the surrounding valleys the scenery is of unparalleled grandeur with many points of picturesque beauty primeval forests cliffs ravines and caves immediately at hand the climate is of such a character as to exempt the residents from malarial or pulmonary troubles it is especially adapted to the requirements of a school whose terms were to be held in the summer months and with midwinter vacations to suit the convenience of a southern population whose home life was more or less likely to be broken up in the summer 
the conception of a grand landed domain as an important feature in the planning and planting of an institution of learning was at that time quite unusual in america colleges and universities had previously looked to populous centres and environment to build them up and sustain them the university of the south deliberately chose to go out into the wilderness and create therein its own environment the site had been carefully studied by bishop hopkins who was an accomplished architect and landscape gardener and who had it mapped and had a tentative scheme of buildings designed for it upon the models of the english universities in furtherance of the enterprise bishop quintard accepted the tender of a lease for educational purposes of a school property in winchester twelve miles from sewanee at the foot of the mountains and there established sewanee college with major fairbanks as president of the board of trustees and with rev f l knight d d and a competent faculty in charge although this collegiate institute was formally opened and remained in operation for a time the bishop found it too expensive for him to maintain and so as the university developed he gave up the lease of the winchester property and concentrated his efforts upon the work at sewanee he made immediate efforts to collect funds to advance the work of building up the diocesan training school he recorded with deep gratitude the gift of a thousand dollars and of a handsome communion service from mrs barnum of baltimore the following may out of funds thus early collected a building was erected and called o t hall that summer the bishop and major fairbanks erected residences near oti hall and removed their families to sewanee the episcopal residence at sewanee was at first a log dwelling-house this was improved and added to until it assumed the character of what the bishop was wont to call the cucumber vine style of architecture and acquired the name of fulford hall in commemoration of the canadian metropolitan who had participated in the bishop's consecration memphis had been made the residence of bishop oti in the latter part of his episcopate and as the work at sewanee increased and that place became widely known and its importance recognized the memphians regarded it with some jealousy and sought to secure the person of the bishop by providing a residence for him in that city on the western borders of the diocese the bishop accordingly adopted memphis as his winter residence but his work at sewanee was too dear to his heart to permit his abandoning his home there as much as a bishop could be said to have a home anywhere and so while memphis became officially the ecclesiastical capital of his diocese he strove earnestly to make sewanee the scholastic and to some extent the ecclesiastical capital of all the southern dioceses and in great measure he succeeded it would be impossible to estimate the value of the bishops thus fixing his residence at sewanee not only to the work of building up the university but in its influence upon the cause of christian education for the university of the south has been built up upon men not upon things the faith the enthusiasm and the personal magnetism of bishop quintard drew around him at sewanee a band of high-minded and consecrated clergymen and laymen of fine scholarship and noble aims thus was realized the idea of bishop polk who when on one occasion he was asked in reference to the apparently isolated location of the university where will you get your society replied we will make it and not only so but we will surround our university with such a society as is nowhere else possible in this land the tone the temper the social and religious atmosphere of sewanee came from bishop quintard more than from any one else for the first twenty years of the university's existence at least it could almost be said that bishop quintard was sewanee and that sewanee was bishop quintard and throughout that period fulford hall was the visible centre of sewanee life into it the bishop gathered the spoilia of his travels rich art treasures rare and valuable books and autographs and made it a most interesting place to visit when the building was destroyed by fire in june eighteen eighty nine most of its interior attractions were saved from the flames through the energetic efforts of the students of the university and the elegant building which replaced it retains the name of fulford hall 
therein the bishop passed the last years of his life it is still the residence of the vice-chancellor of the university bishop elliot of georgia the senior bishop of the southern dioceses was likewise deeply interested in the university and was ex officio chancellor at the suggestion of bishop quintard he called a meeting of the board of trustees to be held at university place in october eighteen sixty six it was attended by the bishops of georgia mississippi arkansas and tennessee respectively together with several clerical and lay members of the board who unanimously resolved that the work of establishing the university be prosecuted bishop quintard was appointed a commissioner to solicit funds for the erection of plain but substantial buildings in order that the university might begin its work at the earliest possible date he accordingly made a trip to new orleans where he held services in all the churches and made an earnest appeal at every service to the church people of that city to carry on the work in which the first bishop of louisiana had been so deeply interested he was able to report the results of his visit to new orleans at a meeting of the board of trustees held at a private residence in montgomery alabama on february eighteen sixty seven bishop elliot had died in december eighteen sixty six and bishop green of mississippi had succeeded him in the chancellorship of the university bishop quintard's report to the board was of such a character that the board proceeded to the reorganization of the university forthwith the bishop offered o t hall at sewanee which was capable of accommodating a goodly number of students as part of the property of the university on condition that the board adopt the diocesan training school for which the building had been intended as the theological department of the university and the offer was accepted the actual establishment of the theological department was delayed however for nearly ten years and until more favourable opportunities offered the deliberations of the board upon the question of the most feasible plan for beginning work resulted in the recommendation that a vice-chancellor be elected and that this officer be charged with the duty of soliciting subscriptions and otherwise advancing the interests of the university bishop quintard was thereupon elected vice-chancellor and major fairbanks was appointed commissioner of lands and buildings to act as general agent and business manager to be associated with the bishop in the work of soliciting subscriptions to reside at the university site and under the direction of the executive committee to have charge of all business affairs of the university no more efficient officers could have been selected and with this action of the board the university scheme might be said to have been fairly launched of the trials and antagonisms the bishop was to meet with in his work there is no need to speak now it was no easy matter to solicit funds for this project at that time not only had the south been impoverished by the war but the southern people had not become fully acquainted with the changed condition of their affairs and did not fully appreciate the value of a plan to educate their sons and make the best citizens of them in june eighteen sixty seven at the request of the trustees the bishop made an attempt to raise funds for the erection of additional buildings confining his efforts to the state and diocese of georgia early in august the cornerstone of st augustine's chapel was laid by bishop green in the presence of a concourse of clergy and laity the occasion was signalized by a dignity of ceremonial befitting the prospective magnitude of the undertaking the function began with a celebration of the holy communion in the portion of o t hall then used as a chapel the bishops and clergy moved in solemn procession to the spot selected the doctors wore hoods expressive of their degrees a scholastic as well as an ecclesiastical tone was thereby given to the function and from that time forward the university of the south conformed in the details of its regulations to the models set by the english universities in eighteen seventy one the university then in full working order adopted the cap and gown for the distinctive uniform of its advanced students divided the academic department into juniors and gownsmen and provided rich robes for the chancellor and vice-chancellor 
in these respects it was quite in advance of other institutions of learning in america though its customs have since grown in favor with other and older universities still it was possible for some one who attended the commencement in eighteen ninety one to write probably nowhere else in america is there any such formal and stately collegiate ceremony as at sewanee in eighteen sixty seven the bishop being in england he consented at the earnest solicitation of his friends to spend the winter there and to do what he could to promote the cause of the university the influential friends he made in england took up with enthusiasm a movement which resulted in such liberal offerings that the university was enabled to start afresh with most encouraging prospects of final and complete success the rev frederick w tremlett of st peter's church belsize park london inaugurated the movement and a committee was appointed which issued a circular inviting subscriptions the committee consisted of the archbishop of york the earl of carnarvon viscount clanborn afterwards lord salisbury the lord bishop of oxford earl nelson lord john manners and the right rev w e gladstone and others the archbishop of canterbury the most rev campbell tate in a letter expressed his deepest interest in the project and subscribed twenty five pounds toward it the archbishop of york and bishops of the anglican communion from all parts of her majesty's realms expressed a like sympathy among the subscribers were names of great distinction both in state and church considerably more than ten thousand dollars was thereby raised and with this sum the bishop returned to america much needed buildings were erected in sewanee and on the eighteenth of september eighteen sixty eight as vice-chancellor the bishop formally opened the junior department of the university of the south thus after twelve years of labor and anxiety of disappointment and sorrow after the death of bishops polk otey elliot rutledge and cobbs all of them actively interested in the project for building a church university of the first class in the south that would in some degree do for our country what the universities of oxford and cambridge have so well done for england and the civilized world the university of the south began its work for god and our land that day has since been annually observed at sewanee as foundation day among the men who were early attracted to the work at sewanee were brigadier general josiah gorgas who had been head of the confederate ordnance department and became at first headmaster of the junior academic department of the university and was afterward made vice-chancellor brigadier general f a shoop who was now the rev professor shoop acting chaplain and professor of mathematics general e kirby smith and colonel f t sevier the bishop's old friend of the first tennessee regiment who became commandant of cadets and headmaster of the grammar school for it was but natural that the military feature of the school should commend itself to men who had just passed through war and had seen the benefit of military discipline upon life and character these men felt that a higher duty awaited them at the close of the war than trying to make money that the training of the youths of the land as christian citizens was of paramount importance and they gave themselves up to that educational work the splendid sacrifice of these and others set high the standard of the university and invested it with a poetic beauty and a sacredness that dwells there still nowhere in the south said charles dudley warner in eighteen eighty nine and i might say nowhere in the republic have i found anything so hopeful as the university of the south of the wisdom of founding this university said a visitor who spent the summer of eighteen seventy eight at sewanee no one would question after a single visit here its highest development is yet to be obtained its present standard is equal to the best but its aims are to reach the highest and best culture obtainable it is slowly and surely reaching forward and satisfactorily filling the measure of its allotted work it is difficult to explain to one who has had no opportunity for a personal observation how many excellent formative influences are here combined 
everything here promotes a feeling of reverence and respect for sacred things the presence and influence of men of high standard in church and state whose example is potent for good the book of nature is always open here to the investigations of the geologist the botanist and the student of natural history the physical education goes on with that of the intellect an invigorating atmosphere strengthens the capacity the various gymnastic and military exercises give a clear complexion an elastic step and a noble carriage and then mind and body acting in healthy unison fill out the measure of a well-rounded man bishop quintard's ideals regarding the university to the upholding of which he was giving the most valuable years of his life were shadowed forth in his words to the convention of his diocese in eighteen seventy four in referring to the meeting of the board of trustees which he had attended the previous year it is the aim and purpose of any true system of education to draw out to strengthen and then to exhibit in active working certain powers which exist in man planted indeed by god but latent in man until they shall have been so drawn out education is not the filling of a mind with so much knowledge though of course it includes the imparting of knowledge as education is the drawing out of the dormant powers of the whole man it must in its highest sense be commensurate with the whole man the body must be trained by healthful exercise the mind or thinking power must be drawn out and strengthened and finally a heart must be sanctified and a will subdued it is the aim and object of the university of the south to give to its students every advantage physical mental and moral to develop a harmonious and symmetrical character to fit and prepare men for every vocation in the life that now is where we are strangers and sojourners and to teach all those things which a christian ought to know and believe to his soul's health the momentous and concerning truth that intellectual power unrestrained and unregulated by sound moral and religious principle tends only to mischief and misery in our race has been in the educational systems of the age almost overlooked the heroic struggle the university was making began to attract admiring attention gifts began to flow into it small as compared with those that have been given to the cause of education in these later days but large when the impoverished condition of the south from which many of them came is taken into consideration and not only was the continued existence of the university guaranteed but its ultimate success was assured the responsibility and work devolving upon the vice-chancellor of a university even in its nascent stages were too great a burden when added to the cares of a large and exacting diocese and bishop quintard resigned the office of vice-chancellor in eighteen sixty eight in order that some one else might be elected to fill that position an effort to secure the valuable services of general robert e lee for the university resulted in the following letter washington college lexington virginia twenty three september eighteen sixty eight right reverend and dear sir absence from lexington has prevented me until to-day from replying to your kind interesting letter of the twentieth of august last i have followed with deep interest the progress of the university of the south from its origin and my wishes for its success have been as earnest as my veneration for its founders and respect for its object have been sincere its prosperity will always be to me a source of pleasure and i trust that in the providence of god its career may be one of eminent benefit to our country that it has survived the adverse circumstances with which it has been surrounded and has surmounted the difficulties with which it has had to contend is cause of great rejoicing to me and i am glad to learn that it has so fair a prospect of advancement and usefulness 
i need not then assure you that i feel highly honoured that the board of trustees has thought of me for the office of vice-chancellor and i beg that you will present to them my fervent thanks for their favourable consideration they have however been misinformed as to my feelings concerning my present position and even were they as represented i could not now resign it with propriety unless i saw it would be for the benefit of the college i must therefore respectfully decline your proposition and ask you to accept my grateful thanks for the frank and courteous manner in which it has been tendered as well as for the considerate measures you proposed to promote my convenience and comfort i am with great respect and highest regard your friend and obedient servant r e lee to right rev w m green d d chancellor of university of the south commodore matthew fontaine maury was then elected by the board and when commodore maury declined the bishop withdrew his resignation and continued his work in various parts of the south in the north and in england he represented the needs of the university a trip made to new orleans and galveston in eighteen seventy was in some respects characteristic of the bishop's appeals and of the breadth of scope of the university as presented by him in galveston the first person who responded to his appeal was a hebrew one of the most active helpers was a presbyterian and these two with a churchman composed a committee to work for the university of the south in eighteen seventy one the academic department was formally organized by the election of five professors in eighteen seventy two the bishop again resigned the vice-chancellorship and general gorgas was elected to succeed him general gorgas was in time succeeded by the rev dr telfair hudson and he in turn by the rev dr thomas f gaylor in eighteen ninety three the last named was succeeded by bishop quintard's son-in-law dr b lawton wiggins an alumnus of the university of the south and the preserver of what his father-in-law had founded but the bishop's interest in the university was not relaxed wherever he went he represented the needs of the university as well as those of his diocese in eighteen seventy six he attended a matinee at the london residence of lord shrewsbury cards of invitation had been issued by the earl and countess of shrewsbury and about three hundred guests assembled the lord bishop of winchester presided at this meeting which was organized in the interests of the university of the south not so much to collect money for the university as to make known in england the work the university was doing the church in scotland was represented by the primus and by the bishop of edinburgh the irish church by the bishop of derry and rapo and by the bishop of moray and ross a large number of prominent clergymen were present addresses were made by the bishops by lord shrewsbury a j beersford hope m p and others in eighteen eighty seven bishop green died and was succeeded in the chancellorship by bishop gregg of texas when the latter died in eighteen ninety three his logical successor was bishop quintard who however felt unfitted for the office by reason of his infirmity of deafness which had come to him in his later years he accordingly stood aside and favoured the election of the right rev dr dudley bishop of kentucky bishop quintard had seen buildings of permanent character grow up upon the university domain built of sawanee sandstone unsurpassed either in quality or appearance as a building material he had seen the theological department opened in eighteen seventy eight the medical department opened in eighteen ninety two and the law department in eighteen ninety three he had acted as consecrator at the elevation of an alumnus of the university to the episcopate of louisiana he had consecrated as his own coadjutor one whose life had been closely connected with sewanee and the university he had ordained to the priesthood many alumni he had seen degrees confirmed upon many men who were to go out into the world and carry the influence of the noble work the bishop himself had done so much toward establishing and in many ways he had seen in the church university whose broad foundations had been wisely laid by godly men who inaugurated the enterprise a visible advance made toward the ideal set for it by its founders and refounder 
footnote a five other alumni have been elevated to the episcopate since the bishop's death the last convention at which the bishop presided was held in sewanee in eighteen ninety seven the bishop shortly afterward went to england to be present at the lambeth conference held that year he returned to sewanee somewhat refreshed in body and resumed the work of his diocese but further rest became necessary and he went to darien georgia in search thereof there the end came on the fifteenth of february eighteen ninety eight his body was brought back to sewanee lay for a time in the o t memorial church watched by the clergy and the sisters of st mary and was thence taken to st augustine's chapel where the service was said over it by the bishops in attendance the university was not in session at the time but the university town was filled with sorrowing friends representing the army of the late confederate states the clergy and laity of the diocese the house of bishops and the alumni of the university the coadjutor bishop of tennessee now bishop quintard's successor committed his body to the ground in the sewanee cemetery a movement was begun soon after the bishop's death to endow a professorship in the theological department of the university as a memorial of him very fittingly the new grammar school dormitory erected on the university domain in nineteen o one was named the quintard memorial but the greatest monument and the most lasting one to the second bishop of tennessee is and will be the university which he refounded and did much to build up end of chapter sixteen end of dr quintard chaplain c s a and second bishop of tennessee by charles todd quintard